They say that time heals all wounds, but does it really? How long does it take to get over the pain of losing a loved one? A year? Two years? A decade? A family in Ohio has been asking themselves the same questions after losing their daughter 32 years ago. Even worse, her killer is still free. Let's dive in. Amy Renee Mihalshevich was born on December 11, 1978 to Margaret McNulty and Mark Mihalshevich. She lived in Bay Village, Ohio with her parents and older brother. Her mom worked at Trading Times Magazine while her dad worked in customer service. Amy went to Bay Middle School and was described as a bright and outgoing girl who loved horses and nature. October 27, 1989 started off like any normal day. Amy rode her bike to school and a police officer came and gave a presentation about stranger danger. Ironically, one of the girls in the audience would be taken by a stranger a few hours later. It was around 2.30 p.m. Amy and two classmates had gone to Bay Village Square, as usual, but this time it was different. Amy was meeting someone, a new friend she's been talking with on the phone. Amy was super excited about this new friend. He was going to help her find a gift for her mom. Her mom would be so happy, she thought as she entered the strange man's car. Amy's brother, Jason, Jason came home at around 3.15 p.m. that day and was surprised when he couldn't find his sister at home. She always got home before him and she was never late. They usually both called their mom at work to check in and tell her they'd arrived home safe. So Jason called his mom to report that Amy was not home yet. Margaret remembered that Amy had mentioned that she'd been trying out for the school choir and told Jason not to worry about it, at least for now. He called back at 3.30 p.m. Still no sign of Amy. Margaret was now worried. She had this nagging feeling that something wasn't right, so she decided to head home. But as she was about to leave, the phone rang. It was Amy. Margaret was super relieved, but only for a minute. She asked her daughter how the tryouts went, and Amy said, okay. Then she asked how she was doing, and Amy said, fine. The one word answers seemed kind of weird, since Amy was usually really talkative. But Margaret thought she was calling from home, so she didn't push for answers. They said bye, see you soon, and hung up. And that was the last time Margaret ever spoke to her daughter. Margaret went back to work thinking that her daughter was okay, but the weird feeling just kept on nagging. Finally, she couldn't stand it any longer, so she grabbed her stuff and went home. She found Jason waiting for her in the driveway. Amy was still not home. In a panic, Margaret drove over to Amy's school, hoping to find her there. Hopefully, she'd just been caught up there, right? The school was already closed, and Amy's bike stood alone and abandoned at the rack. But where was Amy? What had happened to her? Margaret drove down to the mall and called all of Amy's friends, but no one had seen her since that afternoon. She then had to go to the police station and report that her daughter was missing. She told them about the unusual call she had received from Amy and how she suspected that something was seriously wrong. It was so out of character for Amy to just disappear like this. A massive search soon began as police scoured the area, even using horses and helicopters. Neighbors and strangers came in to help as every other activity came to a standstill. Missing person's posters were placed in store windows across Bay Village in hopes that someone had seen what happened to Amy. The FBI was also brought in and they started to interview people that lived in Amy's neighborhood. That's when some disturbing information came to light. They learned that Amy had received a call from an unknown man calling himself Frank. The man claimed to be Margaret's workmate and asked if Amy would help him get a promotion gift for her mom. Amy said yes and agreed to meet him at the village square after school. Some of Amy's classmates told the investigators that they saw her talking to an older man who looked like he could be her father. The witnesses helped the police build a sketch of a white man in his 30s or 40s and is about 5'8", medium build, and dark hair. Some claimed he wore glasses, but others couldn't remember. This info confirmed their fear that they were dealing with a really dangerous situation. If they were ever going to find Amy, they needed to get her quickly. They followed every lead, interviewed every suspect, and searched every corner, but found nothing. Amy's parents went on TV begging her to come back. Just find her, tell her to come home, Whatever is wrong, whatever is wrong, just have her come home. The whole community was totally shocked by what happened. They never imagined that anything like this could happen in their quiet little town. It's a shock. We're a very quiet, uh, safe community, 
And when something like this happens, it just uh, seems un unbelievable. Then on February 8th, 1990, the news that everyone had been dreading came in. A jogger had found the remains of a girl in a field 50 miles from Amy's neighborhood. She was soon identified as Amy, and she had been dead for a while, probably since the day she went missing. The poor girl had been hit hard on the head and had injuries to her neck. She wore the same clothes she had on the day she disappeared, but some items were missing, like her black ankle boots, turquoise horse earrings, and a Buick leather binder. The police believed that her killer kept these items as souvenirs or trophies. That's so awful to even imagine someone doing that. The coroner also found some gold or yellow fibers on her body, which they suspected could have come from the place where Amy's life was taken, or the vehicle that was used to move her remains. The search for Amy had ended in a tragedy, and her family was totally heartbroken. What kind of monster could do this to an innocent girl? Investigators were now searching for a cold-blooded killer who clearly had no mercy. He had taken a girl in broad daylight in front of witnesses, yet managed to walk away without getting in trouble. For years, investigators chased down leads that came to a dead end. The detectives interrogated hundreds of suspects, but no one was ever arrested. In November 2006, almost 20 years after Amy vanished, it was revealed that several other girls had received phone calls similar to Amy's a few weeks before she disappeared. The unknown caller claimed to work at the same place as their moms and wanted to help buying presents to celebrate a promotion. Some of these girls had unlisted phone numbers, so how did the man contact them? Investigators learned that Amy and the other girls had visited the local Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, which had a visitor's logbook. The girls could have signed the book and added their personal information there. Investigators collected DNA samples from several suspects there, but nothing concrete came out of it. In 2016, investigators learned that a blanket and curtain that they'd found near Amy's remains had hair similar to Amy's dog. Detectives believe that the items were used to hide Amy's body before leaving her in the field. They believe the items would help find where Amy had died and urged anyone with information to come forward. We need somebody to come forward that has direct knowledge or indirect knowledge of who did this. Then, in January 2019, a woman came forward with the information that everyone had been waiting for. She identified her ex-boyfriend as the man responsible for what happened to Amy. The woman told investigators that she and the man lived a mile and a half from the mall when Amy disappeared. She said that the man worked at Bay Village and had a niece in the same grade as Amy. But that's not all. According to the woman, her ex-boyfriend didn't come home that night, which she thought was unusual. He later called her at around 10 p.m. asking if she had seen the news coverage on Amy. Investigators later noted that the man in question used to look like one of the two main suspect's sketches obtained through witness interviews. And to top it off, he also used to drive a gold Oldsmobile with a tan interior that matched the yellow and gold fibers found on Amy's remains. When her remains were found, the FBI barricaded the road and took the plate number of every vehicle that passed. They noted that a car registered to this particular man passed through the roadblock that day at around 5 p.m., when he had no reason to be around the area that day. The man soon learned that he was being investigated, and so in November 2019, he walked into the police station, probably hoping to take suspicion off himself, but instead, he made some pretty alarming comments that made the detectives even more suspicious. He said that 1989 and 1990 were a dark period in his life, and also claimed that he might have met Amy's mother in a bar. The detectives asked him if he ever called Amy. He answered, I could have. It could have been a wrong number. When he asked if Amy was ever in his car, he replied, I don't believe so. But when they asked him again if it was possible, he gave an alarming answer saying, okay, but I don't know what the situation would have been. The man also agreed that his DNA could be on the curtain that was found near Amy's remains. He later agreed to take a DNA swab and polygraph test. He failed the polygraph test miserably. The police then asked him to come back the next day and sign paperwork to search a storage unit that he owned, but he never showed up. The investigators later got a search warrant for the storage unit and took away some items of interest, but they haven't revealed what those items were. Also, the two witnesses who had described the man at the shopping center talking to Amy picked this man's picture in a photo lineup as the same man they saw that day. As of 2021, the police have not yet charged the man, but they are still building a case on him and gathering evidence. Because of this, the man's name hasn't been 
released, but what we know about him is that he's currently 64 years old and living in his car. So maybe after 32 years, there might be light at the end of the tunnel for this case. Amy's family have suffered a lot. Her parents divorced soon after, and later her mom died after years of heartbreak and despair, knowing that her daughter's killer was running around free. Amy's dad, Mark, has never been able to forget the moment his little girl was taken away from him. At least a couple times a week, it, I do think about it. Uh, uh, and uh, it's something that you can never stop thinking about. So He believes that the truth will come out one day and that Amy will finally find justice. That's the end of our video for today. What do you think of this case? Will Amy ever get justice?